I've often said that my family many times is the best critic I have of my sermons. And I understand I misquoted some verses, at least the citations this morning. Now somebody couldn't find Romans 53. If you really thought it was there, you might need more help than I do. <laughs> but I think I did say later on Isaiah 53. And I uh, understand there was one more, but nobody could remember what that one was. So uh, if you caught it, then just go find out <laughs> where it ought to be. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I can have it written right down here before me, and some reason or another, from the time it goes to here, processes and comes out here, it gets somewhere else. I could not help but think in the prayers we've been offering, and I hope all will continue to do so regarding our brethren from here and elsewhere in the UK at this time preaching the gospel. That last song caused me to reminisce for a bit because all the men that I knew over there that I worked with originally have already crossed on over into eternity. And that's certainly a, a thought that when you realize that there is a mansion awaiting us, but it all is dependent upon our steadfastness, our determination to love the truth and bring our life in subjection to it, that is to be obedient. Our text today is coming actually from verses 17 and 18 of Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. But I'm going to read all the way from verse 13 through 18. So we'll get back to 17 and 18 in a moment. So I begin reading in verse 13 of Ephesians 6. Paul writes, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your sins, your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now I said I wanted to zero in on verses 17 and 18. So I will say this regarding that part of what I've just read to you. Paul, of course, as you realize, is speaking about the Christian's need of the whole armor of God. But it's the Christian's responsibility to do what's necessary to put on the whole armor of God. You can encourage me to put on the whole armor of God. You can teach me what it is. Uh, you can show how it is effective armor in the battle against Satan. But I've got to do it. I must will to do it. I must will to understand the Bible. I must will to be determined to submit to the teaching of the Bible. It comes down to a very personal thing. Now the point we want to emphasize, emphasize here is the last part of our verse with all perseverance and supplication of the saints. And more than that, I want to just look at perseverance. Perseverance. Now notice that this armor that we read about in Ephesians 6, 13 through 18, is available and it is to be worn by every member of the church, every Christian. But this armor is nothing Nothing at all unless the Christian has the right state of mind, the right attitude, that is, the right disposition of heart. And Paul speaks of this even in verse 18. He first speaks to the Christian's need to engage in prayer. The Bible has a lot to say about that, and that's worthy of, of a study by itself. But nevertheless, to be petitioning your Father in heaven according to the teaching of the Bible regarding the needs of that we have in service to Christ, that we might be faithful. He also needs to watch, as we've emphasized, and this is what this lesson is about, with all perseverance. Now, the word perseverance means to persist in something, to 
endure in spite of elements or things or people that might be arrayed against you. From its Latin roots, the word literally means through severity. That's rather interesting. Persevere comes from through severity in its Latin root. We're interested in perseverance, as Paul said we must, in the passage we read, where we are today, in our culture, in our society. In an age of instant oatmeal and microwave popcorn and all sorts of other instantaneous quick foods or fast foods, the idea of perseverance, uh, many of us are just not too big on that idea. <laughs> Uh, we want to step into heaven while we're still wet from the watery grave of baptism. But we must realize we've just been born into Christ at that stage. We're just beginning. It's not ending. We're babes in Christ, new creatures in Christ. We're just starting out on the road that helps us develop the Christian character. We want everything today, at least too many of us, to be delivered to our doorstep, on our timeline, at our convenience. I find it interesting with all the supermarkets all trying to now get in on uh, call and order you foods and come by and pick it up at the curb or else they'll even bring it to your house. Everybody's in competition on that nowadays. So everything is make it as easy as pop possible and quick as possible. That's really where we are. But it won't work that way in living the Christian life. Before we can persevere... Now, now listen to me. Before we can persevere, we need to severe. <laughs> Before we can persevere, we need to severe. Now remember, we noted earlier that the word literally meant through severity. And this can come in the form of tests, trials, and troubles. You know, that's all a part of growing up in Christ and becoming more like Christ. I feel sorry for churches that have preachers and elders that are trying to tell people no big deal about being a Christian. Just be baptized and coast right on. You can't find that in your New Testament. Nowhere is it found in the whole Bible when it comes to serving God faithfully on this earth. And if you look at most false doctrines regarding salvation in Christ, it has God doing all of it, nothing you've got to do. That just doesn't happen. It never has been the case. In fact, I'll make this rule and point it out to you, or at least note the rule, and that is what man can do for himself, God, God never has done. Now, God will do for us what we can't do for ourselves. I'll give you an example. We couldn't get the Bible on our own power. God gave that to us. We couldn't do what was necessary to save ourselves because all had sinned and come short of the glory of God but Christ could, so he did that for us. We couldn't suffer, bleed, and die like Christ did, so God did that for us. What we have to know is that we can study and understand his gospel. We can love him enough to obey him. We can know that our faith in God is made living and active only when we're obedient to what God said to do and the way he said to do it and for the reason he said to do it. So one cannot persevere without severe. The faithful Christian will know his share of troubles. I can't think of a, of a bigger lie that Satan could sell any one of us saying, Now, look here, you're one of God's children. You're special. And we mentioned that this morning. And you know that's true. But parents have children, and if they're normal parents, their children are exceedingly special to them. But go back to Hebrews 13, and you'll find out that God chastens his children, and then he likens it to how parents chasten their children. But he points out parents chasten their children to get them to do what they want them to do. But God chastens us for our own spiritual well-being. See, we have this view that says if God loves us, He'll let us do anything we want to do. 
That's part of what we were talking about with the Nero brothers over here. I noticed they're sitting a long way from one another because they were talking about being in a family of 11 kids and all of them being home at the same time and how their mother took care of that situation. I guess, uh, would it be fair to say she ruled with an iron hand? But I bet it was a hand of love. A switch hand. Well, I don't know which is... <laughs> You get the job done anyway. It's like the fellow said one time, said, uh, he talking about his new dishwasher. And said, it has this, had just turning on the switch. And the other fellow didn't have a dishwasher, but he had kids. He said, I got a dishwasher too, and it works with the switch also. <laughs> so so uh, God wants us to use this ground, this time in this life, to prepare for heaven. Would heaven be worth much to you if you didn't have to Prepare yourself for heaven. Think of the things you do in life that involves training and teaching and self-discipline, whatever it may be. And that's when you, you appreciate it more. We encourage our little kids when they're doing little things at the first few years of school. And we try to be positive and encourage them on these little scratchings they do and all this stuff. Well, why do we do that? Because we want to keep them keeping on from that point to greater things and studying and preparing themselves. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Yea, all who uh, that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's about as clear as I, I know you can make it. If you are going to be godly, if you're going to do what God says, you're going to obey His commandments, you're going to think like He does, look at the world in the light of His truth, and so on, then you're going to be persecuted for it. That's about as plain as Acts 2.38, isn't it? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Certainly it is. Well, then why is one more acceptable than the other? Paul had his share of troubles, to say the least, or to say the best, whichever way you want to look at it. He listed this in 2 Corinthians 11 and 24 through 28. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. He was beaten five times, and each time he had 39 licks. Well, one of those is about enough for me. I might say the Nero boys, see, that's, I don't think that'll amount up to yours, <laughs> to yours up to his. He says, thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. And, and one of them that really gets me, you know, if you see all this stuff at, with what's under the water down here at the Gulf, you know, you fly a helicopter or a plane over it sometime. They're taking pictures down there. And you see people all out there swimming, and there'll be something about as long as that pew going right between them. All this. Well, this next one, he says, and I've been in uh, a night and a day, I've been in the deep. Now, think about that. A night and a day, I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen in perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And this is what I like to read, and I've always preached it as a gospel preacher to elders, and now being one, I certainly remember it, beside those things that are without. That which comes upon me daily. But it's not just one church. It's the care of all the churches. So not all troubles are external though. Many of them can be internal. And most of those we develop ourselves. We can place tremendous pressure upon ourselves through taking thought about things. We can't do a thing in the world about. Which we commonly define as worry. Sometimes we set unrealistic goals for ourselves. I think I've run across that quite a bit in people's lives. Then there's just thinking negatively toward our friends. You know, I don't care how good, and I mean by good, faithful you are to the Lord as a brother or sister in Christ. If I want, since we're picking on Nero's today, <laughs> Zach, I don't care how good you are. If I want to think bad about you I can create in me an attitude that finally just has you the awfulest thing that ever was 
And so how we handle our mind, how we control our thoughts, we can get to the point where we're not th thankful. We just see everything, well, why this and why not that? I think this world we're in today is certainly not a very thankful world. We don't rejoice in the Lord. Think about what I read about the Apostle Paul, all that he went through. Yet he's the one that wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We have a false concept of what it is to be full of spiritual joy and to reflect it in rejoicing in the Lord. See, every one of these things that Paul underwent for the cause of Christ, he counted it joy because it just simply indicated that he was doing what was right. We need perseverance when we get ourselves into these kinds of situations. That is, we don't let them get us down, we get them down. We stay with it. Nobody's going to make me quit. Uh, that has to be within a person. I like to think of it as being stubborn with the truth. You've got to do that. You can't just say, well, he treated me wrong. She treated me wrong. They don't understand me. They don't care about me. They're this and they're that. And all that stuff's going to be negative. I can't even think about what it'll be. But it'll be that way in a person that starts down that road. And yet, we don't count our blessings and name them one by one. What if nobody really cared? You know, if I didn't care about you and you didn't care about me, we wouldn't have anything in the world to do with any of us. Nothing. We'd just see the person beaten and robbed and naked and left by the road and say, glad I'm not him, just keep trotting right on down the road. That's what the priest and the Levi did, and yet they should have epitomized godly concern and sympathy. We persevere through trials. Now, that's how you grow in Christianity. That's how you grow. Do you ever pray for growth and development? Well, you better not be too serious about that because the trials will come, I promise you. They will come. Peter said regarding those who suffered various trials, that the trial of your faith, is your faith on trial? Well, there was somebody's faith was on trial. Well, the Holy Spirit had Peter write that. That the trial of your faith. Now watch what he says about it. Being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. You know, you, your gold gets better the hotter you burn it because it burns the impurities out. Notice, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.7 so many times we set our goals like the world does. We want it here. We want to receive the praise and all of that here. Well, there's not a thing in the world wrong with Christians encouraging one another and patting one another on the back when there's genuine sincerity there to encourage people to keep on keeping on. James said, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he's tried... And that tells us what temptation means, being your faith put to the test. When he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. James 1.12. So enduring tests of our faith, enduring trials that come upon us, will help us to persevere. Truth gives us a reason to persevere. We don't live in an age that likes truth very much. Truth is whatever suits me or whatever goes along with my view of things. Truth is not considered absolute and objective and outside of me. So you hear people saying your truth and my truth, your God and my God, or my God wouldn't do that and all that rigmarole. If you want to know what God will do or not do, you want to know how he deals with man, you go to his word where he plainly says it. He tells you plainly what he's going to do with man and forgiving him and finally at the judgment and judging all men. Truth gives us a reason to persevere. It's not enough to persevere if we don't have something to hold on to. Truth is not going away. It's always there. It, it's always right here, real close by. And you can study that book and get it in your mind. And even when you don't have it available in its book form, it's in your mind and you can just start quoting Scripture to yourself. I, I don't like... See, what is the test you get where you have to go through that tunnel? What is, what is that? What, MRI? Oh, I hated that and I had to have one of those. Because, you know, that thing is right here in front of your eyes. And uh, 
So I just decided I'd think about something else. So I started singing gospel songs in my mind and quoting all the scriptures I knew. Works pretty good. Make you realize you'd study more, no more scripture, but just start, close your eyes sometimes, start quoting scripture, see how far you can go. Sure will take your mind off whatever else is going on. So truth is worth persevering for. In order for our perseverance to have value, we must have truth in our lives. We've got to persevere in doing the right things, and the truth is the only thing that tells us what's right. When all else is crumbling around us, this gives us something to hold on to. You look at the people around about you. When you have an episode like happened in Las Vegas or you have some sort of catastrophe here and there, just look at how people respond. And you'll find out they don't have anything to hold on to. They're just very, what's going on? What's going to happen? They're grabbing for something, but because they don't believe in God and they don't believe in Christ and they don't believe in the Bible, they're grabbing at something. And knocking doors yesterday came across the first Buddhist. And they were Anglo. They weren't of the Orient. And uh, couldn't hardly understand the man with a strong accent at first. He said, uh, he said, we're Buddhists. He said, we're just traveling a different path. <laughs> couldn't pass that up. I said, yes, we are. We're all headed for the judgment. And they just happy to agree with that. That shows you people don't know what's, talk what's going on. Uh, of course, we always quote around here, John chapter 8, 31 and 32. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We must, we must abide in Christ's words to have that truth, to have it in our lives, to have it where we can appeal to it. In Acts 4, 21 through 22, Luke records this, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples. Now listen to what he said. And exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Has that changed? Is that still the truth? Doesn't it uh, go along with all who live God and in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution? By persevering in doing what is right, we can be assured that our perseverance isn't empty. We all know 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God is well pleased with such sacrifices. The Hebrews writer penned in Hebrews 13, verse 16, But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now, in the Old Testament system, they had all sorts of sacrifices. We forget that we are to live our lives as living sacrifices, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And that's what Paul's talking about. But he calls them sacrifices here. As you do good, as the Bible defines what is good, and as you teach the truth and you live your life a godly example as you follow the teachings of Christ, then Paul is calling that sacrifices, living sacrifices. <laughs> Knowing and practicing the truth will aid us then in perseverance. But time enters into this also. It is a necessary component to perseverance. We can't say that we persevered until a sufficient amount of time has gone by. We're all familiar with the question, are we there yet? Now when such a question is asked without a sufficient amount of time passing, we know that someone has not been persevering. You know, to me, Parents traveling, say, six or seven hours in a car with two or three children ought to understand perseverance. They ought to understand the child has little. Because after they've gone for 15 minutes, are we there yet? Well, I see a lot of members of the church traveling down the way to heaven. And they're saying, are we there yet? 
They haven't persevered. They haven't gone through things where God's given them the opportunity to apply the principles of Christianity to all sorts of trials and tribulations that show up in a person's life. Repetition also helps to persevere. I guess the best way to say this is the more we experience something, the better able we are to endure it. I think you have to get a little age under your belt before that becomes clear. But it doesn't just jump on you because you've gotten older chronologically. It means that you've all through that time till you get to a stage of being older that you have met the wiles of the devil with the truth that you've known all along. And you find out he's limited as to what he can do. It doesn't mean that you don't fear him anymore. It just means you know which way he's coming. I think that's what Paul meant when he said, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. We know exactly what he's going to do. We recognize the temporal nature of things that happen in time. And this helps us to persevere. Persevere more. Even this will pass away. When you're having one of your uh, happiest days, everything's just hunky-dory, <laughs> whatever that means. Everything's just great. Well, just remember, even this shall pass away. Well, when you're washed out of your house, <laughs> when you're in bad shape, whatever it is, physical or whatever, even this shall pass away. And it would be good for young people to realize too, if they live long enough, even this, your youth will pass away. And it's very good for older people who have fought the fight of faith and continuing to fight it to think of songs that are designed to help us persevere that there's a mansion now empty just waiting for me. So even this shall pass away. And no wonder then James talks about life in the flesh. Life is like a vapor that appears for a little while then vanishes away. So don't put a lot of investment more than you need to into the affairs of this present world. For even this will pass away. Here's what Paul said of persecution to encourage Christians to cause them to persevere. For our light affliction. Now I want you to go back and remember what he described by detail. And yet he says light affliction. Well he's talking about of the Jews five times received nigh forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. And so on. But he says light affliction. Which is but for a moment. But it does something for us as we hold on to the truth through all of it. Works for us far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Here's how it works. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. When we know that our days on the earth are limited, and they are, time can be our friend as we struggle to persevere. The psalmist had this to say in Psalms 90, verses 9 and 10. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Notice you don't cease to exist. You fly away. And so we have a song. I'll fly away, O oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Time is our friend in developing the art of perseverance. And the last one is trust. Trust. You know, Jeff here a couple of weeks ago, Jeff Litke, in his good sermon I've referred to and others have several times, had something to say about trust and forgiveness. He mentioned that people who you place your trust in and then they prove they're untrustworthy. You may forgive them, but they've got to build that trust up again. For us to persevere, we must trust in the Lord. 
Trusting in God will get us through difficulties like nothing else and will help us persevere. God will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus said, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the world. It, you know, it just doesn't make any difference where you go as a Christian in this world. Christ is with you. In Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, we see that when we trust in God, we can know our paths are directed by Him. Because our trust is built upon what He tells us. And the Lord doesn't go back on what He tells us. When we trust in the Lord, our future will be secure. But you won't have to worry about whether the United States government falls apart or whatever happens. It's going to be secure. In Psalm 37, 5, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. Imagine how that was put to the test in the lives of Daniel and the three Hebrew children. Their whole nation was wiped away and they were carried off into Babylon. But God went with them and God stood by them. Remember when the three were cast into the fire furnace because they refused to disobey the law of Moses and bowing down to that idol? And he had the furnace made hot and hot and hotter. Even burned the folks up, we threw them in. But when Nebuchadnezzar looked in that thing, did we not throw three men in the fire? But there's a fourth, and he has the visage of the Son of God. I like that old song. I don't like many of these because they tend to have too many denominational errors in them. But I like that old quartet song of many years ago. They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, and they wouldn't burn. When we trust in the Lord, we have a safe haven. Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. When we trust in the Lord, we shall endure. Psalm 125, 1, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. When we trust in the Lord, we have great strength. The great Messianic prophet Isaiah had this to say in Isaiah 26, 4. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Trusting in the Lord is key in developing perseverance in service to God, which means faithfulness to His cause. So I hope we've learned something about how to persevere, how to face what life offers us, as a Christian, how we can face whatever it is the devil throws our way. So to develop perseverance, we need tests and trials. We need truth. We need time. We need trust. And thus, at the end of a sermon like this, you offer the invitation. So if a person is listening and understood and yet remains outside of Christ, they know that they're lost and undone and in need of Christ and His gospel, to believe that He is with all your heart based upon the evidence of the Scriptures, Romans 10, 17. To repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30, and confess your faith in Him as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And then to complete your obedience to the Lord in becoming a Christian by being baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. The Lord will add you to His church, and there you can serve Him faithfully all the days of your life, persevering in the way we talk today, until you stand before him in judgment and are blessed to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You realize what he's saying, don't you? Blessed are you who persevered, who stood the test, who didn't quit when the going got rough. Well, as a child of God, it may be that some have stumbled and not changed back to the way of truth. But you have this opportunity to repent of your sins, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness in obeying God's second law apart. God stands ready to forgive any man regardless of the sins. He loves everybody. But we must be the one to do the acting upon His will and demonstrate our love of Him and faith in His system of salvation by obeying Him as we take Him at His word. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus, then we invite you to come to Him while we stand and sing.